and it feels sort of surreal sitting yeah. on earth and listening to how mars sounds like but mm-hmm. the second part like where that winds start playing i just close my eyes and just listen to it and imagining i was kind of walking on the surface and those winds were just like passing by oh man that that felt uh, like you said surreal to me you can definitely do that if we have a terraforming plan like the one elon musk has uh, you know hinted at Uh, uh do you know of that plan where we have this huge no, really. huge array of uh, mirrors which would be orbiting mars and they would fo- focus all the sun's lights on mars and it would start up the heating cycle in mars and you would also want to get away of this carbon dioxide and for that we have this plan of inducing uh, cyanobacteria into the atmosphere so that will just eat away carbon dioxide and give out oxygen Hey Kiosphere. I'm Pratham here and I'm Suraj. So on this channel each episode is a random open-ended conversation about some of the topics that have intrigued or fascinated us. Uh we pick something interesting that we wondered about and bounce our thoughts, ideas and perspectives off each other from the little bit of experience that we've gathered from books and movies and stories that we've heard. So yeah. So I wanted to start off with the origin of the word planet. It comes from the word planetes. which means wanderer nice so yeah so imagine you were like uh, you know in ancient greek or something and maybe you're someone who's fascinated with the stars and you've been observing them every night and kind of noting down their positions relative to each other and you notice that through the months and through the years some of the dots in the sky seem to move relatively across the positions of other stars mm-hmm. so you name them planetes and That's why these particular five dots seem to be unique in a way even though they look the same as others they seem to have a different motion and they look different so i'm just mm-hmm. going to try to maybe explain that uh, for our listeners so if you consider all the stars uh, that are in our night sky right they're so far away in the night sky that from the position of the earth they look relatively the same you can think of all of the stars on a larger like a much larger sphere if the earth was in the center of that sphere and we observe all parts of that sphere as the earth goes around the sun so basically all of the stars are on that sphere which is called the celestial sphere and the image of any one part of that seems pretty much the same if we look at it even after a few months so you can almost think of it as a flat image where the relative positions of the stars to each other are pretty much the same uh no matter at what time of the year we look at it okay if you just consider let's say in the center of a page i'm just going to try to draw you an image maybe for the youtube video we'll we'll include like a small demonstration for folks watching it on youtube but just for our listeners i'm just going to draw a small image so that we can kind of get into this um let's say at the center of a page there's a the we put a dot for the sun and we just draw a semicircle on top representing the earth's orbit and on top of that we draw like a horizontal line with the stars of the celestial sphere so maybe we can just draw five random dots on that line not uh, equally spaced and call it like a b c d e or something like that and if the earth was on the right side of this uh, semicircle let's say those months were like may or june and on the left uh, left half or towards the left end it would be like maybe in november or december so when we observe that flat plate where the stars are like a b c d e we see them equally spaced whether we were observing from the right side that is on the months of may and june or when the earth traveled all the way to the left side when it was november and december it would look relatively the same does that make sense yeah yeah okay cool so and but now let's insert the orbit of mars as well on top of the earth semicircle we insert another semicircle and put the orbit of mars and let's say both earth and mars are starting from the right side and continue their orbital motion okay so now when we observe mars from earth let's say it is a little further ahead in its orbit so when we see our night sky let's say it seems to be in between the stars a and b mm-hmm. okay 
But Mars takes a longer, bigger orbit, so it travels a little slower away from the Sun. So as the Earth crosses Mars in its orbit and goes a little further, it seems like Mars's orbit is going like Mars as relatively to the positions of the stars A, B, C, D, E, starts moving away from A and towards C and towards D and towards E. And as the Earth's or Earth crosses the, let's say, the topmost point of that hemisphere, the semicircle, and it starts moving towards the months of November, December, now if you look at Mars, which is also at the topmost point of its uh, semicircle, it seems like it's coming from the position of D and E. So when we look at our night sky, it seems like Mars is going backwards. So first it was traveling towards the left, and as we passed it by, it seems like it traveled towards the right, and then again back towards the left. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? Yeah, yeah. So that's the retrograde motion uh, of the planet Mars, and that was observed by uh, the philosophers and astronomers of even the ancient periods and ancient Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato. And specifically, one uh, one observer called Ptolemy, and he even created like a small model to explain that retrograde motion. It wasn't correct, but it was a good attempt to explain that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty fascinating that at that time, they actually noticed that five of these objects weren't, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sticking to the same celestial sphere. And they were wa wandering off. Yeah, to think like if something like that was there today, I mean, how many of us would be spending time observing that tiny little bit of difference or just yeah. like the others kind of going about our everyday life without caring much about that thing, right? To observe that and to note it down for so many months and years and to realize that that similar retrograde motion is being shown by only these five particular stars and naming them differently. I call them stars because at that point they would all seem same in the sky, right? It's only after observing uh, that they were different, they were named differently. Uh, and now today we of course know them as planets. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good. Hey, uh, but so all, all these planets have retrograde motion, is it? I thought only Mercury did. Uh, I don't think we observe it in the night sky, you know, because it's on the inner side. Ah, huh, yeah. So we can only observe it during mm. uh, sunset or sunrise. Okay. Mm. No, I I is it the uh, is the point that we do not observe it, or it doesn't happen? Yeah, I think uh, there is a retrograde motion, but I don't think it's completely visible because those planets, like Mercury, are on the day side of Earth, right? Yeah, yeah. And not on the night side. So we can observe them only during sunrise and sunset. So if you were to plot a map and do it, you would see a retrograde, but uh, yeah, not very easy to do that, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we won't be able to visibly see that, uh, but if we were to observe it without the you know glare of that sun, it would yeah. appear as a retrograde motion, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So, so what I was kind of like, you know, what fascinated me is when I was like looking at Ptolemy's model or... Uh, or some of the other astronomers of that time who tried to create, tried to basically form an orbital motion, which were all geocentric, where the Earth is the center of the solar system mm -hmm. and the universe, and trying to explain the observations of the night sky. Mm -hmm. And fast forward, like maybe 1500, 2000 years later, when uh, Copernicus was able to create a heliocentric model and explain all the things that were not making sense. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward another 500 years to today, where we've sent missions and orbiters and so many things to Mars and we know so much more about the planet. So it's kind of nice where it started off and where we are today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I always like to think about this fact that what if we were able to you know, show the images of uh, Mars to Ptolemy or uh, Copernicus or even Galileo? Like, man... <laughs> I really want to <laughs> yeah. see their reaction. It would be crazy. Yeah. yeah. Or just the yeah. fact that explaining to them that we've sent man-made objects to Mars and beyond it. Yeah. yeah. I think mostly for them it's like it's the heavens and kind of like untouchable and mm. never be able to go on that or never be able to step on that. And 
like it's kind of funny like you mentioned images because for me the first few images that i saw were some of the rover selfies and uh, maybe <laughs> yeah. we can include that also in the video so like some of the selfies from the rovers and particularly one that uh, the way you can see the shadow of the rover mm-hmm. and the background planet mars yeah i i think it was uh, opportunity maybe if i'm not wrong okay yeah the opportunity rover yeah i i think so also um you know i just want to set a uh, context here and tell about some very basic similarities between earth and mars and if we were to look at outer space and if we were to even think about colonizing any planet for that matter it would be mars and uh, and that's because of these particular similarities so the first one is mars takes about 24 hours to rotate i think it's 24 hours and 30 or 40 minutes like that so a day in earth is almost similar to a day in mars so that's one and mars is also tipped on its axis so it has seasons like we do and that also has polar ice caps so we have i think it was uh, i'm not sure which mission it was uh, the, where it saw the you know me- meandering river beds and those canyons mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so that prompted us to think that okay this could have harbored water at some point in its history yeah i think that the polar ice cap that you're talking about is that crater no i think it's called the korolev crater uh, or something yeah, of yeah. the north where like whenever you see those images you see that around the northern near the northern pole it it's like this circular ice yeah, kind of yeah. a thing well i mean that also brings up the question that you know whether we want to kind of fix earth and control our uh, expansion or do we want to kind of also i mean abandon maybe not abandon but maybe diversify if mm-hmm. the earth run yeah if it kind of runs out of resources use uh, mars as a plan at b <laughs> <laughs> but uh, i mean i don't think for if it runs out of resources because uh, I mean what resources that does mars have that as in like if the population is too great and we are like that yeah you yeah. know what i mean like terraform yeah okay yeah so if you're talking about terraforming mars i think uh, i mean if we have any shot at terraforming anything it would probably mars would be our first option right yeah so that's one and i think it's also because of uh, the main idea of an asteroid uh, striking earth so we really do not yet have a plan to you know uh, combat that so you mean just as a like you know not putting your eggs in all the same basket exactly <laughs> so we just you know uh, split humans into uh, uh, earthlings and martians and higher chances <laughs> yeah we have higher chances of survival yeah but you know for me i for some reason i always feel like if we want to uh go to mars it shouldn't be as a i mean that asteroid scenario is one thing but it shouldn't be as mm-hmm. okay the earth is so unlivable right now or we've exhausted it or ruined it so badly that we need a fresh start on another planet for me it should be more like an adventure it should be the yeah the primary reason should be exploration and adventure yep. like increasing humanity's understanding and going to another planet and experiencing it like that would be such a I don't know like an out of body experience kind of like something nobody has ever seen before. Exactly. So that should be the primary reason instead of, you know, any of those. It shouldn't be because we did stuff that we can't uh, reverse do. or yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely I totally agree with that because I mean if you look at the arguments uh, against moving to Mars, so many people think that, you know, we can if we have the capability to terraform Mars like geoengineer Mars Uh, so that it's habitable we can certainly do it to our own earth so that's one yeah but it's definitely if you think about like asteroid strike not many people know about this but the asteroid strike that uh, you know obliterated the race of dinosaurs that was not the mm-hmm. first one there were like a dozen like uh, half a dozen or dozen extinction level events before that So it's pretty common that we see asteroid strikes in the lifetime of a planet and we currently do not have any mechanism to combat that so we should definitely start uh, you know <laughs> like putting our eggs in different basket which would be mars in this case so that's one and 
you know, you can make an argument saying that, okay, if we can still uh, terraform Mars, we probably can come up with a mechanism to combat that asteroid strike. So something like just bat it out of the way or use a, a new cover. Uh, like a laser or something. Yeah. No, not, no, not just that. Like I'm thinking more in terms of, uh, you know, sending a, uh, a missile or a, like a robot Rocket. sort of thing. Yeah. So to just slightly nudge it out of the way when it's far, far away so that its direction just changes a bit so that it misses Earth. Is there a movie on that? I, I somehow, like some recollection of a movie is coming to my mind. Probably. <laughs> but, the, but the problem with that is, like I didn't know this, but uh, we really do not have so much capability, although we have so many telescopes, like we do not have such capability to discover uh, those objects. I think if it's less than, I don't know, uh, 500 within meters, a certain, uh, yeah, within... Yeah. Yeah, within certain distance, like we really can't, uh, it's almost impossible to notice it. Unless you are looking at that particular direction for something else and you happen to notice it, there's no way we'll notice it. But actually, I mean, it's interesting you bring that up because I think just like a couple of days back, I was reading this uh, news on a new comet seems to have entered the solar system near Neptune, maybe. Okay. I don't know if you came across that. No, I haven't. It just like popped up on my feed and I was just kind of... Uh, seeing it a little bit. Anyways, check it out if you haven't. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I mean, so since you brought up the point that, okay, it may not be easy for us to grab it, mm-hmm. it seems like we seem to be doing okay when something new appears in the sky or in the solar system. Enough satellites and resources and telescopes to mm-hmm. kind of m- see if there's any discrepancy and a new... Yeah. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, but again, that that also has its size limit and beyond which it, yeah, it it's extremely yeah. hard for us to get it. Yeah. Anyway, so even if we can do have the capability at some point to, you know, um, observe all those and bat it away, I think finally we should still do it, still go to Mars for the sake of exploration and for the sake of that wonder and adventure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be so cool. Yeah, but just imagine if you were the first people to step on another planet. Like, it's literally a whole other world. And nobody's experienced that before you. Exactly. Ah, oh, man. Yeah, and you know what uh, another amazing thing would be? Just like I told how it would be amazing if we could show all these images of uh, Mars to, uh, you know, Ptolemy or Galileo, those people... It would be really amazing if, you know, 50 or 100 years down the line, some people who would be Martians at that time listen to our old podcast and, uh, you know, they can, they, they think that, okay, what if we had shown all this video footages or how we are playing, we invented new sports and that Martian gravity and send it to us. Wow, that would <laughs> be <really> crazy. <laughs> now I'm trying yeah, to imagine yeah. that. I'm trying to live in nostalgia in present. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it kind of like, you know, think about how different life would be over there. Uh, like, like how would your day be if you were on Mars right now? And what would you wear? Like, will you still have to kind of wear something that helps you breathe properly? Like a suit mm-hmm. or something or... You know what I mean? And would you be localized to one place or could you move around the planet? Yeah. Could you explore? Could you go to the different places and decide to go on an expedition or something like that? Like you have a whole planet to explore. Like I find that's like one problem with where we are. We, we're too late to explore the planet and too early to explore the yes. universe. Yes, of. definitely. <laughs> so... Like, if you were the first folks on Mars, you'd have an entire planet to discover for yourself. And you could just go wherever, if resources or if the kind of setup we had over there allowed you to exactly. do that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And you'd be the first to experience so many different things. Yeah, I know, right? Oh, man. So, uh, you know, uh, you also don't want to be just, uh, you know, roaming around aimlessly because you can randomly get hit by a earthquake. You mean uh, a Mars I mean, in, quake. in Mars, exactly. How on a, how on Mars would you get hit by an earthquake? <laughs> oh, there. Yeah. 
<laughs> the, but uh, you know i didn't really think of this um, uh, that tectonic activities uh, in mars and this mission i think it was insight so when that rover was there it the, one of its main purpose was to measure the seismic activities of mars and they me- they have measured over 500 mars quakes till now then is that the one with the seismometer and it's been placed on the ground and it can detect tiny vibrations and stuff i'm pretty sure it's that yeah 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 i think and i've seen the, that yeah and one of the important things that they noticed was because of that because they measured the seismic activities they actually found that uh, mars does have some amount of liquid in its core not water or anything specific they know that there is some liquid in its core oh wow okay i don't know yeah that. yeah that's pretty cool yeah actually that also brings me to the latest mission which is perseverance uh, i think you know about it so mm-hmm. one of its main objectives is to you know study mars's history so what it has is like it has this sort of tube which would which you would drill into mars and you get a tube of all the stratification stratificated layers of mars so when you look down you have all these layers through time so you just study those layers and you know what happened over the, the history of the planet yeah the history of the planet just like we do here on earth yeah it's crazy you know these missions seem so ambitious and it's really i don't know it just makes me think a lot like how like it reminds me of that you know when you cut the stem of a tree like the the wood part of it uh-huh. you see those rings and you can kind of tell its age and stuff like these exactly. things are so universal in a way and the same goes for the planet you scoop out its layers mm-hmm. and you see what's the strata and you can tell like what's happened on that surface exactly and the the the, the ambitious part of this is it's not even coming back now they are all they have already planned future missions which would go and pick that up and come back to earth oh wow like they yeah That's they're crazy. designing the yeah they're designing a mars ascent vehicle right now Oh man, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, I know right. And when they were discussing about this thing that, you know, you would see this tube of all this uh, stratifications in Mars, I couldn't help but think that geologists they peer down into Earth or Mars or whatever body that they're studying and they peer down and look uh, through time. And astronomers on the other hand, they look up and they see through time. by measuring all those wavelengths of light. Oh, that that's some um, Okay, I'm just thinking now. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting actually. Basically anything mm-hmm. that kind of gets trapped, whether it's traveling towards you or getting trapped in the layers of something, preserves mm-hmm. some kind of information and in a way it kind of traps the happenings of time, the times of that planet or that galaxy or that portion of the night sky yeah definitely and talking about perseverance i think like do, are you aware of that 7 minutes of terror in the context of nasa and mars and oh, was that the descent yeah so basically any descent on mars it takes roughly around 7 minutes uh when they send these missions and they, it's been termed as 7 minutes of terror because it's pretty scary not like whether the rover will land perfectly or not and will the descent go as planned or not so i think perseverance was the first mission which sent back a video of that whole uh, lapse of 7 minutes and it's pretty crazy i think uh, if you guys want to check that out just just go on the mars website of nasa there's a there's yeah. a specific dedicated uh, site just for that and has some pretty cool stuff uh, some good video and some good images and all the different missions to the planet You know, speaking of that uh, descent, that seven minutes of terror. Uh, have you seen that uh, actual footage of uh, the camera pointing up, so where you can see the parachute? Yeah, yeah, I think I have. You're talking about perseverance as well, uh, yeah. itself, right? Yeah, yeah, perseverance itself. Yeah, I think I have. Yeah. Do you know the you know the secret Easter egg over there? Mm, not really. Okay, so if anyone you know gets a chance to watch that, you definitely watch it. And when the parachute deploys, just observe the colors in the parachute. So I think it's white and red, but it has a strange pattern. 
and many people were thinking that okay i mean it might be a coincidence but it was just too strange uh, for it to be a coincidence so people actually took that image they analyzed it and they saw that it, it's actually a binary code what? and when yeah and when they decrypted that it it read dare mighty things you know you know what I, what that actually means dare mighty things mm-hmm. so that's actually yeah that's kind of i mean that's the that is the motto of uh, jet propulsion laboratory and oh. uh, that yeah that means like dare to do mighty things so we have to be brave enough and uh, strong enough and courageous enough to even take that brave leap to do uh, difficult tasks and explore and go on an adventure push the boundaries yeah push the boundaries yeah so and sir uh, and uh, shockingly that's not the only easter egg over there it has um, that that parachute it has sort of concentric rings over there and one of the ring is uh, dare mighty things the other is actually the coordinates embedded as binary code and those coordinates are of jet propulsion laboratory so that's where this uh, you know rover was made Oh, wow is that something mm-hmm. like you know expecting some i don't know some civilization to discover it later or something like that uh, not really i mean it's just as a simple gesture to our own like mm-hmm. mankind itself okay and it and this is not the first time that they're, they're doing this like nasa has actually uh, been doing like leaving these easter eggs uh, since many missions oh okay i didn't know that That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And also the rover on the rover like uh, there's also this motto and there's some images and some essays and I think there's some 10 million names on it. Oh, engraved. Yeah. It's kind of like back to the Voyager kind of a throw the bottle and I, see a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when I re- when I saw that it was like definitely uh kind of inspiring and that you you have this all of that easter egg yeah for sure i mean yeah i'm kind of still thinking about it like i don't know maybe like decades later somebody discovers that and you know uh, what do you say decodes it and it'll be such a cool thing yeah yeah and t- talking about the perseverance rover i wanted to kind of make you listen to uh, the sounds recorded by that rover so okay i'm going to play that out and yeah so for everyone listening in uh, you know it would be better if you put on your headphones and pause it right about now and then listen to the track so i'm going to play that now Okay. So what do you think? Yeah, damn. This audio it just adds another dimension to your senses. Like before we could see only the images of Mars. I think this is this should be one of the first missions which added microphone to its rover, right? Which captured the audio. I think so. I think so. Yeah, it it just added a really another dimension to it and it feels sort of surreal. sitting yeah. on earth and listening to how mars sounds like i know like the when i heard for the first time i just kind of closed my eyes and was imagining how so the first part of it is kind of a little interference from the uh, rover itself like the friction between its uh, legs and stuff i think but mm-hmm. the second part like where that winds start playing i just closed my eyes and just listen to it and imagining i was kind of walking on the surface and those winds were just like passing by oh man that that felt uh, like you said surreal to me yeah definitely um and i think 
I, I, I don't know if this is exactly how it sounds because I know that Martian atmosphere is a bit different and like it's more bassy, I guess. So I, I'm not sure if this is adjusted to it, to Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. You're talking about that attenuation, yeah. right? Uh, not really. Like the, the audio is shifted down uh, its frequency when you're listening in Mars because of the atmosphere. Yeah, because of the... I think it's because it's less dense and the speed of sound also is different and uh, the atmosphere has carbon dioxide so it absorbs mm-hmm. some of those high-pitched frequency sounds. So, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, it sounds a little different but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's adjusted but nevertheless it sounds like crazy, right? Yeah. Uh, and it also kind of... Like, have you heard of this concept of dust devils? Not concept, it's like a phenomena that happens on Mars. Dust? Dust devils. Um, I know that there there are like massive sand dunes and sand, sand storms. I mean, so is that what you mean? No, but I still want to take that tangent because I think one of those massive, uh, you know, Mars-wide dust storms was the reason that the Opportunity rover shut down. I think that was like two years back. And so basically there was this planet-wide dust storm that occurred and it it stopped the communication from the Opportunity rover. And then even when the dust storm had subsided, uh, NASA couldn't establish communication. And the majorly strongly suspected reason is that the dust has covered its solar panels. Mm -hmm. So the rover can't generate enough uh, electricity or power to communicate. Mm -hmm. So after trying for months to establish communication, finally NASA gave up and had one final attempt, which didn't work out. And I remember like because... The internet was flooded with pictures of the Opportunity rover and everybody was like, goodbye, Oppo, and making it like a very emotional thing. <laughs> and I felt that intensity while reading all those posts and seeing all the pictures. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the reason uh, this time. I- I'm not sure if Opportunity had this, but Perseverance has its own uh, battery backup. So it doesn't rely on solar panels. So it has oh, okay. uh, plutonium... I don't know, 238 or something. like. But, but it has a radioactive element over there which powers the entire rover. So it doesn't matter if solar panels don't work. That's pretty so cool. Another, yeah, so another advantage is even if it's night, it can uh, operate uh, like it's fully functional. Okay. Hmm, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, so NASA has this record of all these uh, glitches and all the mistakes that have happened previously, you know, just like the one that you described because of the dust storm, the solar, solar panels got covered. So uh, because it has all the data about that, the way it plans for the next mission is such that all these mistakes are doesn't, are, they are accounted for. So the engineering team is like really seriously good at it and uh, they come up with such unique solutions so that none of these mistakes ever happen again. Yeah, it's pretty crazy that they have a record of everything that's ever happened, right? And they'll maintain that and check for every subsequent uh, mission. It's yeah. like, I don't know, it seems like a very cosmic thing to do for any civilization that's going to be spacefaring and explore. I know, right? Yeah, I hadn't thought, thought of this way. It sort of seems like evolution. Even our DNA, yeah. it rejects, like, uh, it cuts down on all the things that we don't use and only the traits that are useful to us, that's carried down. So it's sort of like that. Changing all that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, like, but coming back to the dust devils thing, so, uh, you know, it's basically like these tiny cyclones. Um, I think it's not as, it's not like a conical shape, it's more like a cylindrical shape. So this was captured by one of the rovers. I think it was uh, Curiosity. I'm not sure though. Mm. So it actually captured a time lapse of one of those cyclones going around. And it's almost like a video. Uh, And, you know, like when I was hearing the sounds of that, the Mars, the wind from that audio, Mm -hmm. and I came across this thing, this dust devils thing. I literally, I was just imagining what would that sound like if you were stepping and walking somewhere on the surface of Mars and you and one of those started spinning up and traveled across the terrain, you could observe it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if it could bring down the that rover. And I, I know that these dust devils, like they really do get into the moving parts of the rover and like, you know, d- destroy it. So imagine if we are out over there and if our suits are whatever we are wearing it's not designed to handle that like that that's definitely a disastrous thing yeah 
I, I mean, that's just like one of the things that the rover observed. But who knows what other phenomena occurs over there? And maybe in certain parts of the planet that haven't been explored yet, or at certain times when we wouldn't have captured that event. Maybe exactly. Yeah, and that also actually reminds me of something else. Have you seen that uh, picture of sunset on Mars? It was captured by both the Spirit uh, rover and Curiosity. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. It's like this bluish, faded bluish uh, ball of light. Obviously, much smaller than how it appears on Earth. Mm-hmm. And there was also again a time lapse of that, like the sunset, the sun setting from the surface of Mars. Mm-hmm. And there've been those images where it compares the sunset on Earth, and it looks like a completely different experience. Yeah, man. Like. If we have different civilizations living over there, like if we've split apart, we would, I think, definitely have different experiences of all this and remember it very differently. Yeah, like future children on Mars would have never experienced the sunset on Earth. To them, sunsets would always be this bluish, faded light going down yeah. towards the horizon and disappearing. Yeah, yeah. And that also kind of brings me to the idea of procreating on Mars, right? Like. How I don't know how would it be when the first generation who never lived on Earth lives on another planet and calls it their home? The, like the idea of Earth would be so foreign to them, and I don't know. It would be such a different experience for them to grow up in that environment. Yeah, definitely. I think you know the first explorers who go there and uh, the first settlements uh, when it starts. the ones that have traveled from earth would still have that uh, that feeling of earth as its home but when they procreate and when the next generation of people come about they would i'm pretty sure they would have you know mars as uh, their they they would call mars as their own default instinct yeah th- as yeah. a default instinct yeah. yeah so crazy right to think like when will that happen or mm-hmm. i don't know if people I don't know maybe in the century if we will experience that. Yeah. Would you want to go to be one of the first people on the planet? <laughs> yeah, obviously. Knowing that you may not come back. Ah. <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that then I definitely would. But you know even thinking about that I'm pretty sure if, before manned mission to Mars uh become a thing we would have sent many rovers and we would have established a successful transit to it and uh, probably built a dome sort of hmm. or an underground uh, station of sorts uh, station yeah you know that's one of the plans like uh, do we build a dome on top of the mars surface or do we actually carve out um, into the you know mars terrain and live underground because then we do not have to worry about wearing all those suits and all those things interesting and you wouldn't have time for like fancy things and stuff like if you were the first generation there i i mean i'm just imagining how comfortable would life be because we're talking in terms of this magical experience but there's like a very real survival factor and you'd have to spend a lot of time maintaining uh, you know your food your water your module like your living space where you're living and stuff created by whichever organization sent you there so like the everyday basic needs would occupy a whole lot of your time and i don't know how much uh, time would you have for all this extra curricular kind of like exploration and doing other things which which seem to be fascinating for us so yeah that kind of makes me think a little bit <laughs> but bro like how different is it from what we're doing now <laughs> like i would rather do it over there than do it here I mean, even here, like it's well, it's just. But it's like way, way too comfortable over here, right? Don't you think? Ah, uh, but for me at least, it definitely outweighs uh, the difficulties that I would face in Mars. <laughs> well, just maybe the we should go there and then. Yeah, 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 definitely. I'll 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 go there and <laughs> blog about it and <laughs> try inviting <laughs> Earthlings over there. It'll be nice. I mean, for sure, it'll be like a crazy experience. But I'm just thinking in terms of you know how real it would be. Yeah, yeah. But man, like every moment would feel like you're so alive. Like all your senses would be like exactly. So th- that that's really a good point actually because when we are on Earth, like we don't really think much about you know reality or life or space all that. But when we are when you're actually over there, you sort of. Uh, 
you mostly your think about that. would be in that yeah. yeah like your 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 frame of reference would be in terms of survival and space and exploration and all of that yeah. I, i get what you mean like the background of every thought would be in terms of the big picture exactly uh, at least for a few days or months until you get adjusted to it but still i think it's yeah, a really sure. a life changing experience for sure yeah and for me like the one thing that appeals to me is just to be able to walk freely over there like assuming that we could mm-hmm. if other things were taken care of just to be able to walk freely and explore something new and different like there are a lot of geological features on the surface right yeah. so i would want to go like in the random direction hopefully the rover or whatever we are living in mm-hmm. is uh, transportable like it can move around and not like a fixed thing maybe if that was possible mm. oh, that that would be like the experience of a lifetime for me at least and that kind of for me uh, you know rounds up that whole life on mars mm. if i had to describe how i would like it that that would probably be it yeah yeah and i think you can definitely do that if we have a terraforming plan like the one elon musk has uh, you know hinted at uh, uh, do you know of that plan where we have this huge no, really. huge array of uh, mirrors which would be orbiting mars and they would fo- focus all the sun's lights on mars and it would start up the heating cycle in mars so we don't have to actually build those Whoa. dome and uh, yeah so we would have to build those domes or uh, those things so that we are li- living inside that to protect ourselves from the harsh environment and all that mainly the cold and you would also want to get away of this carbon dioxide and for that we have the, this plan of inducing uh, cyanobacteria into the atmosphere so that will just eat away carbon dioxide and give out oxygen man those are some literally next level plans <laughs> exactly so yeah if we, if we can pull that off yeah maybe we don't have to worry about you know wearing those space suits or uh, living inside a dome or un- uh, under mars so we can just roam around freely that would be wouldn't that be something yeah yeah for sure i think it's just something that is eventually going to happen and yeah i think we can hope that it kind of happens in our lifetime that we can experience something like that but i often think that you know maybe some day some kid and uh an elder like an adult person would be looking at the night sky mm. and they would see a tiny pale blue dot of light and be like look that's earth where we first started yeah <laughs> man that's definitely makes you feel that moment no it it, it yeah it, it gives a very 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 different perspective like this is truly like the in that sci-fi level yeah it's a, this is something i thought <laughs> of like of, like sometime back when i was reading about all these things mm. so it just came to my mind and drew a little bit of a picture over there like they're pointing at the sky and looking at earth yeah and also maybe if they have telescopes i mean they they would definitely have <laughs> telescopes <laughs> yeah so they'll be pointing at earth and Watch, like oh happened. see yeah this is where your grandfather descended from or uh, well the question is how long till that point of time <laughs> yep yeah, yep yep yeah as you said um i truly hope that in our lifetimes we would uh, we at least get a chance to visit mars and come back yep more power to make it alive more power to hear <laughs> on musk to make it happen <laughs> yeah 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 awesome Uh I think we'll probably end it there. So yeah, feel free to leave your thoughts and comments down below if you're on YouTube, if you're listening to us on other platforms like Spotify or Google or Apple Podcasts. Uh you can follow us on Instagram as well and reach out to us at curiosphere to let us know what you thought. And yeah, we've put some visuals on the YouTube video for some explanations wherever we mentioned in the audio. So you'll be able to find it on the description so feel free to check that out if you if you're interested all right thanks for tuning in have a good one